Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are director Milton Justice and musician Gerald Casali, who's the founder of the band Devo. Academy Award winner Milton Justice was born and raised in Dallas. His career in the theater started as a student of Stella Adler, and within 10 years, she had appointed him as uh, her artistic director, as a teacher, and he was running the LA Conservatory for her in Hollywood. Um, Stella Adler was one of your, I guess, mentors? Yes, definitely. <laughs> we would call her that. <laughs> I think so. Milton produced um, the award-winning and world premiere of Tennessee Williams' View Carré on Broadway, as well as Vanities, which became the longest running. Is it still running? No, no. How, how long did it run? <laughs> it ran five and a half years. I thought, did it break the record or has someone break the record Someone has now broken the record. Yours was with Kathy Bates, right? Right. How did that happen? Why, how could something be there for five years? Well, it, it was so bizarre. First of all, um, the director had been one of my best friends in college, as oh, was the playwright, wow. as was the stage designer, and Kathy Bates had been a colleague. So we oh. opened this little play off Broadway <laughs> And it got sort of nice reviews, and then all of a sudden, Liz Smith said in her column, this is my favorite play. Oh, that was it. And it went from being, we were, you know, lucky if we had 25 people in the audience, to suddenly you could not get a ticket. So it was in a small off-Broadway yes, theater. Yes, it was in about a 200-seat theater. Oh, that was pretty big. It, yes. And so it kept running, it kept running. And then there were productions other places, so we, we constantly... Uh, sort of Seth went, wow, who knew? Did they know Kathy Bates? Was she no. a star at the time? No. No, <laughs> she was, we call her the completely unknown Kathy Bates. Who started there. Um, in 1987, you directed a um, uh, documentary, or directed, yes. produced, produced and, right. and got an Oscar. Right. And you had all these Emmys for after school specials. I know. <laughs> I know. It was Don't all. You love it? I, it was great. Uh, and it was all this accidental sort of thing that you and, just and, kept running and, into. And five Golden Globe nominees. Right. Were they for TV films? What were those? Um, for? T uh, one for, was for a TV movie, and then the last one uh, was for a cable movie for Showtime which uh -huh. Kevin Bacon directed and Helen Mirren was in. Helen won her first Golden Globe doing this. And, and that was one of the things you were involved in. Right. You uh, have taught at Stella Adler's and at Yale. Yes. At the same time, <laughs> and at NYU. Yes. And in Seoul, Korea. And did I leave out? Yes, I left out Australia. New Zealand. Oh, yes. New Zealand. Well, actually, yeah. yeah <laughs> Pretty yes. close, right? Yes. <laughs> what, how and what did you teach? at all these different places. Well, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I had been working professionally. I actually had been working for Bob Hope for about five years. And my um, college girlfriend said, you know, you should take a class from Stella Adler. I took it last summer. This was when she was teaching a master class in the, in the summer. She was very stern, wasn't yes, she? she? I was. went to a couple of those yes, classes it, that it she was, gave. Oh, it was remarkable. <laughs> but I suddenly, I thought, wow, that's what I've been looking for. I had worked professionally, and I, and I thought, well, that's part of it, but I don't like it that much. And so I started studying with Stella. And I just, I loved it. I, I, I loved what she was talking about uh, at the uh, Stella Adler Academy, where now, uh, I, I love being there because it, you feel like, you know, she gave us this base of a kind of an art form. And it's that whole big building, too, as <coughs> yes, in Hollywood. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, there's the business and there's the art form, and so you do the business and you say, well, periodically I need the art form. And so that's kind of what she gave us. So I kept falling into that. And then one day I was saying to 
one of the students has said, Stella asked me to teach, well, it was Stella Adler, so she didn't ask you to teach for her. She informed you you were going to teach for her. I like the way it was said. She appointed you. Yes, well, that was it. There wasn't a discussion. And it started because she said, well, what do you plan to do while you're waiting for your film career to, to kick off? Mm -hmm. By which time I, I did have an Oscar, and I thought, well, if not now, when? I'd been living oh, in New York. Oh, you already were pretty... Well, I was working. I, it was never established, but I was working, you know. So at any rate, um, so one of the students said, how did she know that you could teach? And I said, believe it or not, it's because I disagreed with her on something. Oh, right. So she uh, knew uh, you were thinking. Uh, yes. And so that was, that was kind of it. So I disagreed, and she said, it's time for you to teach. Oh, that was it. Well, that was great. So did you teach that style at NYU and at Yale? Yes. And what style is that? Well, S Stella, uh, I, I think she was adamant that a play was about something mm -hmm. and that um, there was a character that existed someplace. And our job was both to uh, make it believable but also to make it good theater and to service the playwright. And so uh, she had a lot of technique exercises that fed oh, into that. Oh, she did? Like what? <clears throat> um, exercises like um, visual exercises that stimulate the imagination, right? So you're doing a play that takes place in the Midwest during a drought. And during, you know, during, in, a, in a flat <laughs> land, like a yes, like a drought. <laughs> and so, you know, part of the exercise is, is like to walk down the road and describe the road and then the fence and oh, the woman gosh. coming near. So what you begin to do is live in that place. And you're observing every e single thing. Everything. Place. And it's in your imagination. Um, and so, so it becomes very, very rich because it's selected. And so you begin, th the talent comes with being able to sec select the things that were really helpful. So you teach directing. Do you teach writing? I teach acting. Acting, you teach <coughs> writing too then because you write those things into your play, don't um, you? Sort of, but really I think, I, I, I always say I'm a terrible writer, but I have a knack for what works. And so um, I don't... Uh, I don't know, I'm one of those people that you say, oh, well, if you f think you know so much, why don't you do it? <laughs> you know, if you think you know so much about writing, why don't you write something? Right, right. And I never liked my writing. But um, what I found was, even teaching in South Korea, uh, where I didn't speak the language and I was teaching f through an interpreter. Really? Yeah, that, that Stella's concepts, uh, the imagination is worldwide. And so it helped actors access something that wasn't so deadly right. geared to my own life. And, and uh, talking about that imagination, you're working on a play now for Imago Fest. Imago <laughs> Fest. Is it yes, imagination? I call it, yes. Well, <laughs> in a way. It's funny. I said, call somebody and I said, where did we get the name Imago Fest? And yeah. they said, well, it obviously comes from imagination. And I said, oh, I know what happened. Somebody was meant to type the word imagination, and they hit the O instead of the I. And, imago. And so well, somebody said, that's good. We'll call it Imago. Yeah, and, and you're directing. It's at the Stella Adler yes. Theater, and you're directing a Mark Donnelly play. Yes. Is it funny? It's very funny and very dark. Mar Mark was a writer that, uh, at one point, I had a, a deal at, at Miramax, for a film and then another deal at Showtime. And then in the midst of this, he recently said, you know, I've written a play. And I said, you have? <laughs> <laughs> so. He's very funny because um, what I was reading about him, he said, I'm chained to my computer. I'm a lonely, pathetic <laughs> thing, you know? And, and my plant even died. He must have committed suicide. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's like so every bad. writer. Yeah. And he sort of sits in rehearsals and he sort of says, uh, I think he's fascinated with what actors do. <laughs> he writes it, it though. But, uh, we, but writers write stuff and then they don't know. It's <laughs> like they have no idea that these actors are going to sit, they're going to struggle, and they're going to say, well, what does that mean? What he said, I don't know. It just came out of my head. That's very good. So that's the play. It's several plays then, Imago Fest. Yes, yes. There are three original one acts. I, I, I think one of the things that... Uh, 
certainly we incorporated that we got from Stella was a part of the group theater, uh, which was oh, right, yes. right in the 30s was the most important theater movement in this country. I mean, out of it would come Arthur Miller, or out of it would come writing, and out of it would come a form of acting. I mean, obviously, Stella taught Marlon Brando, but it all sort of started there. And one of the things that they realized, I think, was it wasn't just enough to be actors. You had to contribute by contributing new writers and new plays. Ah, I see. So that's how the so Imago that's, Fest. Yeah, so Imago Fest came sort of out of, you know, just being an acting school is fine, but it's not enough. We have to... You know, we have to develop uh, writers and new material. Well, talking about helping and developing, you worked with and helped Sigourney Weaver, Kevin Bacon, and, <coughs> and you mentioned Helen Mirren. What did you do with Kevin? He was a first-time director? Yes. I, I knew Kevin's wife, Kira Sedgwick, had been one of the first students I ever had. I coached her for about, I don't know, 10 years or I something. See. And so I... I met Kevin when she was doing a play in Boston, and she said, she, she, I said, well, what's he like? Because he was, re, you know, he was a star. And she said, no, he's kind of weird. So naturally, <laughs> before I knew it, I was getting an invitation to the wedding. Right. <laughs> so Kevin and I had, we became quite close, and we talked about things and talked about things, and he kept saying he was interested in directing. And so, but he didn't know what piece, I mean, oh, you know, so he could so never you. found a piece. And so Kira and I had been working on a project, and so I said, you know, I think it's probably good for Kevin. So we were having breakfast in Los Angeles. I handed it to him, and I said, read this on the plane ride back to New York. And he called me from the car, and he said, oh, you're right. This is terrific. It was perfect. And with, with Sigourney, you directed her one-person play? <coughs> a two-person, oh, actually. Two person? She and, a, she and a, 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 a Co-student of hers from Yale, Krista Rang, who's quite a famous oh, playwright. Oh, well, yes, was it his play? And it was well, the two of them co-wrote it. Wow! And co-starred in it. Krista Rang actually it, it, starred in it too. Yes, He's an yes, actor. Yes, and it was just the two of them. Fantastic! I didn't know he acted. Yes, yes. I mean, he acts that kind of interesting sort of part. Well, but... now it's time for you to act. No, oh, I oh, it's so much pressure. <laughs> Thanks for being with us Thank today. Thank you, Joe. This was fun. <laughs> it was great. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Devo founder Jerry Casali. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here with musician Devo founder. Ohio native, Kent State College graduate, Gerald Casali, pronounced the good old-fashioned way he said, <laughs> Italian Casali. Yeah. Devo's big hit Whip It from the 80s um, was part of his long history. He's done commercials, films, TV shows, and he said, you said you spent six years at Kent State. Why did it take you so long? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I, uh, I grew up blue collar and I was able to get a scholarship to go there. <laughs> so we'll stay and, forever. <laughs> and and I, I graduated after four years. Uh, and then I was slated to go to Ann Arbor University. Oh, I see. To, for to do graduate master. school. I see. And what happened is that spring is the uh, famous uh, Kent State killings. You and, were a senior then? Yeah, I was in the middle of it. I, I was uh, a member of SDS and I did their graphics and their posters and... Oh, so you were already in the arts doing all that, the art yeah, things? Yeah, yeah. I started out like with, you know, a, a, a regular academic program where I thought I was going to be a 20th century English literature teacher. And somewhere along the way, I, uh, I got into fine arts. And I got the bug, and I wasn't going back. That was great, though. Yeah. Because you found what you wanted to do. Oh, I did. Were you excited about being an English teacher? At the time. Oh, you were, but, so it was good. <laughs> but, at the, but, but that quickly flew away. And uh, anyway, because of the, the killings by the National Guard of the students at Kent State and the political backlash from 
all the right-wing politicians like Governor Rhodes, our own Republican governor at the time, all out-of-state students lost their scholarships if they had been a member of any anti-war group. Uh, so Ann Arbor revoked state? my scholarship. Well, oh, oh, Ann, you Arbor were Ann Arbor revoked oh. my scholarship because I had been in SDS at Kent State. Yes, because you were an Ohio native, right? Yeah. So suddenly I wasn't going to the University of Ann Arbor, and I turned around with my tail between my legs, and I did my graduate work at Kent State. Oh, so you just stay there forever. That's why you were six years there. I see. Well, let, let's start with the shooting, since you brought it up. Um, I never realized that you had actually been through that time at school. Yeah. And um, how did you come out of it? Because it was pretty brutal. Uh, well, I came out of it different. Um, I think until then, I, I pretty much just fit into the zeitgeist of youth culture. I was a live and let live hippie kind of guy. Um, and uh, I was slowly being politis politicized by reading good stuff like Noam Chomsky and listening to lectures that came to campus and starting to understand how things really worked as opposed to the, the kind of mythology that we all grew up believing in blindly. In college, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what was interesting is it was not radical. It was merely getting an education about what the Constitution really says, mm -hmm. what the Bill of Rights really says, how legislatures really work, and, and how much corruption and flaunting of the law there was. And so really what Kent State was about that day, the killings, was the expansion of the war into Cambodia by Nixon uh -huh. without an act of Congress, with, without consulting the American public. He just did it. Were you aware of all this going yeah. on? You were aware of it yeah. all? Yeah, students were quite informed then. You, I see. Pe people weren't as devolved back then. And they do they talk, paid attention. Do you talk a lot about it? I mean, Whatever or is I'm it, asked to. Because, are you? Do you like to talk about it? Well, it's like it happened yesterday. I wondered about because, that. Because, uh, you know, like the old hillbilly song, we didn't know the guns were loaded. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> You know, I had been in protests before, and they were always peaceful, and there was a ritual to them. And the law enforcement would say, don't cross this line or you're going to jail. Or somebody would start yelling, and somebody would shoot some tear gas, and it would be over. Well, this, this was very different. Uh, there was clearly a plan by the National Guard and the governor to kind of actually egg on the students and make the protest larger and get it to go out get out of control and they hid in several buildings overnight and when the protest started in the allotted spot where protests were allowed on the commons they all showed up from different angles uh, boxed us in like some old uh, so movie you were right Western. in the middle of it yeah oh i didn't realize you were so in the middle of it yeah. was your brother there with you no mm -mm. oh he wasn't then when no. did you start the band i started getting serious about the idea of the band two years after that. Oh, but, um, I see. But I created uh, the idea uh, with, with a couple friends of Devo as an art movement within months of that. Oh, you had, oh really? Devo, Devo was, was an art was, movement, it wasn't a band. It was <laughs> devolution, was it? Yeah, it was, it was the art of de-evolution. It was all theoretical and, and I was trying to find pieces that, that represented devolutionary art. And so it was de- De-evolution. De-evolution. <laughs> anyway, that day is what really changed my aesthetic and made me no more Mr. Nice Guy because I saw the killings. And two of the four students killed were friends of mine. Oh, they Allison were. Krauss and Jeffrey Miller. Oh. And I was closest to Allison Krauss. At first I didn't know that was her I saw laying there bleeding, but then I did. And there was just this moment like a car crash, like a Scorsese film, like Raging Bull. Everything went into slow motion. Um, all the yelling and screaming and sounds of the guns went away. It was all... Oh, it was silent? Oh, yeah. And, and I thought I was going to pass out just, just from wow. the sight of it. Wow. And I laid down on the grass because it was a beautiful spring day. It was the first nice day we had. There were only buds on the trees. I remember looking up at... It's so vivid in your memory. Oh, yeah. And then it crashes back to reality with just screaming and yelling and 
people crying and women screaming and crying because they could see the bodies. Then we realized, oh my God, they shot at us with live ammo. Uh. And everything changed. Uh, you know, and, and in, it's, it's when you realize that uh, uh, everything you've been told is a lie. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we watched in those in months afterwards, it was very clear. Uh, the media controlled the story and spun it. And people thought the students deserved to get shot. They thought we started the violence. Right. They thought that some student had a gun. It's true. You, that, those are the only things that get out. Yeah. And those are the things we know. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I didn't want to bring it up, but I think it's really important to the way your evolution, devolution, the whole thing started. Because then you started this band. Right. And it was called Devolution. Devo. 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 Was Devo it Devolution? For short. Well, it was, it was, we called it, first of all, we called it uh, the, 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 the Devolution Band. And the Devo, then, yeah. And then we, I was sitting around with my compatriot at the time, an academic uh, guy who was a poet named Bob Lewis, and he uh, and I were in, in his apartment with several other people in our typical evening of pot-fueled discussions and started talking about how that was too intellectual and we had to make it as dumb as McDonald's. And oh, it's, it's true. That's what you really did, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we talked about it and we, then we said, okay, how about devolve? No. And then somebody goes, Devo, he might have said it. And I just went, that's it. Art Devo. There was Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and now there's Art Devo. And we all laughed. And, uh, and Art Devo was the, the merger of the high and the low. That's what we decided. That, you know, we'd all been influenced by proper art history and art education. We loved the um, Dadaists. We loved oh, you, so the you were all aware of that. Italian uh, futurists. <laughs> we loved the German Expressionists. And we uh, loved a, a German Expressionist film, especially Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and noir films like Island of Lost Souls. And so we knew all that. But then what we started doing is looking at the pop culture at the time and just all the junk literature and all the um, kind of fundamentalist religion that was really <laughs> powerful in Akron, Ohio. I mean, it was everywhere. But it was, yeah, uh, fundamental religion, fundamentalism I'm sure. Fundamentalism was yeah, big. Right. And it would come again under Reagan 10 years later, bigger than ever. And, and you were an Italian Catholic family? Yeah. <laughs> So how was that going over? Well, by that time, I had been booted out of my house. I, <laughs> and I, uh, your brother, because you started it with your brother, right? Well, he wasn't in the band yet. Oh, he wasn't? No, the early time. band was a one-off thing, and Mark Mothersbaugh was recruited. We played one time, oh. and then I spent the next two years trying to get everybody serious about it. And when the band got serious, Mark came back, mm. his brother came in, then my brother came in, uh. and we found a drummer, Alan Myers, and that became Devo, the real band, who sat around, wrote the songs, you know. When was that, in the 80s? No, that, that started in 1974. Oh, it started that early, where and you got everybody together? So you guys were really young. Yeah, and it took us four years to take that really <laughs> radical aesthetic and get noticed. Oh, and yeah. And then how did you do that? By the way your costumes were? By the way your songs were? Were those I did tortured the, white men songs? Were uh, those the things? Yeah. I, kind of, I <laughs> we, You know, Devo was kind of like white man robot blues uh, with <laughs> synthesizers. But I did it by just do-it-yourself techniques that were pre-internet ideas of what now kids do on the internet with Facebook. I, you know, would... would uh, write our own press releases and our, do our own posters with Mark and I would go around and put them in the independent record stores. Then we got a single press and I would go around and get it to all the record stores. But you guys were very uh, uh, artistic, yeah. all of you. So you could do like make the yellow color, color do it, cover and do everything yourself. And my good friend Chuck Statler was a, he was a filmmaker. He, he owned mm. a 16 millimeter camera and he was taking film classes from Richard Myers, who was a one-man film school at Kent State University. Uh, In fact, he became a famous underground filmmaker that won awards. So you, so you were working with the kind of people you wanted to work yeah. with that had the same aesthetic. Yeah, and, and nobody understands that Kent State University at that point in time was 
a bizarre anomaly. It was a hotbed of culture and creative activity. Well, we never heard of what the Middle West was. What was the Midwest? Exactly. And this didn't this did not conform to the Midwest. This was an oasis. <laughs> yeah. And we had a constant stream of people coming from uh, uh, New York, you know, like out of, out of NYIT and uh, out of the universities uh, in, the, in Chicago. We had the Black Mountain Poets giving lectures. We had underground filmmakers like the Kuchar Brothers and people like Norman Mailer coming and visiting. Why? Why were they coming there? Because there were a cadre of professors that were oh, very were hip. Cool? Yeah. They bring us bringing everything in. I see. We I did see. field trips to the museums in New York. You know, like months before the killings, I was in New York and taken to a Jim Dine exhibition wow. and taken to a, a Tom Wesselman exhibition. Yeah, because I've only met you in art Right. opening situations, right. except that my daughter said that we took her to see Devo at the Wiltern. Wow. When was that? God. <laughs> that was later on. Yeah. <laughs> Can you was, believe it? Yeah. I went, she went, oh, you're having Jerry on? Yeah. You took us to see him at the Wiltern. I went, I did? I don't even remember that. Yeah. That's how cool it was. That was in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, in the 80s. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you know, it, 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 I, I lucked out in a way. I mean, I just was in the right place at the right time to um, be treated to the information that saved me. And it, it enabled me to get out of Ohio. And Ohio is a good place to be from as, as long as you get out of there. So, and um, so now you got out of, oh, you, you made a big name with Devo. You're still making a big name with Devo. And then we're back. You're, you're back. Uh, you're very entrepreneurial. You're a big success. How did you keep it going all these years? I don't know, you know, I'm the kind of guy that when somebody wants you to die or wants you to fail, I go, okay, that's a challenge. That's <laughs> not going to happen. I'm not going to make it easy on you. You think it happened like that? They wanted you to die? I think everybody that's artistic or original faces mostly negative response and rejection. I mean, that's just the way people are. They can't handle when you're doing something new, and they want it to fail, but then when it doesn't, they love it yeah. because secretly they want it to fail because that's threatening. If, if you're right, then what they've been doing doesn't matter. But you've yeah. been, and, and you had your funny costumes, yeah. you went on stage. Who designed yeah. all that stuff? I did. Oh, you did. Yeah. So you made those funny costumes? I found the yellow suits in an in a industrial catalog from a company that sold it. Uh, janitorial supplies, <laughs> oh, right. and, and we just altered them, put the Devo on them, and then I found black ladies' cinch belts from the 50s to make the thing have a shape. And did you keep it shape. forever, th that look? Oh, no, no, no. Well, I mean, we used new, they only cost, at that time, $3.50 an outfit, so we used them once and threw them away. They were disposable. And then, oh, people, that's what then people wanted them, so we sold them. <laughs> And that started the merchandising thing. We couldn't believe they wanted them. So, and then, and then each each record and each tour had a new manifesto and a new look. You know, we had oh, I the see. red hats. Yeah, yeah, I remember those. Yeah. The the black politician plastic hairdo pompadours. You know. And now you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. And then, did you ever expect that to be? I mean, is your mindset changed? I suppose I'm only a little more beaten up. You know, <laughs> I, I'm less less confident, more beaten up. I mean, the years do that to you. But but I mean, no, I expected Devo to be big like Kiss, you uh -huh. know. And and, and it they never lasted was. longer though. Well, I'll tell you why. We did something right, content wise, uh -huh. where because our message had some kind of substance, we weren't just about a white shirt or a skinny tie or some kind of style that you go, oh yeah, 1980. People that never bought a Devo record and people that didn't even know about Devo today like Devo. I know. Devo it's became true. ubiquitous, like a word in the culture, like it's, oh that's Devo or he's Devo. Because it's cool, you mean? Yeah. Or it's or it's a description. Yes. Yeah. It's an adjective, an adverb. <laughs> right. And people associate us with with also outsider art and uh, you know what I mean, a disenfranchised right, right. public. Well, we're so glad you came and talked to us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And keep writing, 777 South Figaro, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And check out our last release, because nobody can find it. Oh, let's check uh, it out. Okay. It's called Something for Everybody, 
And you can find it online, but I think Warner Brothers only pressed up 25,000 CDs that had a beautiful 10-page booklet in it. Oh, that, and you didn't uh, bring it for us to see. Oh. I, I don't even have one. Oh, because they didn't make enough. Didn't make enough. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jerry, You're for welcome. being with us. You're Bye. Welcome.